We're made it through the different continents. We've made it to Oceania now. This is the smallest continent as far as size and population. All right, but it's very, it's obviously it's an important one. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned this yet, but Antarctica is also often considered a continent. We're obviously not going to be covering that since the population is zero, which actually isn't true. I actually heard that it can have up to a thousand people during throughout the year, but it's all like this science uh, colony of scientists, you know, that are doing research and stuff out there, which if anyone wants to go preach to the thousand scientists that live in the colony, uh, go ahead. But they're probably all atheists anyway and, and evolutionists. <laughs> all right, but, uh, uh, but anyway, so is Australia. We'll talk about that in a minute. No, I'm just kidding. They're not, they're not all, uh, all atheists. So I'm going to talk tonight about the influence of Oceania on the U.S. And actually, I'm not going to talk that much about that because there's not a whole lot for me to say about the influence of uh, Oceania on the U.S. I'll kind of flip it here in a little while and talk more about the why our influence on them isn't seeing, uh, you know, r righteous things that, that we would hope to see, especially uh, as Christians. All right. So when we talk about Oceania, we're talking about Australia uh, and then all just a bunch of, of the islands there. Some people call it the South Pacific or Oceania is the name of a uh, common name of the um the uh, colony, I mean, the uh, continent. And now there's a lot of different uh, groups of islands, right? And I already mentioned Hawaii is actually one of them. And so, you know, from Hawaii to New Zealand to uh, uh, some other island, I can't think of what, what it is, you know, that every, every island in that section is called like Polynesia. And then you got uh, Melanesia. Oh, they're right up here. Uh, Melanesia, Micronesia. Melanesia, I think, includes Papua New Guinea. And the cool thing about Melanesia is that's the only place in the world where you'll see a, a group of people uh, who have black skin and blonde hair. It looks like bleach blonde hair. It's really cool looking. And uh, so then that's something kind of unique about that. Papua New Guinea has some, uh, some of that uh, race, I guess, or, or ethnicity. And so uh, you have, yeah, Micronesia, which obviously really small, thus the name micro, small islands there. And, uh, and uh, you know, just I'm talking thousands of islands. So there's no way we can go through. And a lot of them are very, very diverse. Um, uh, you know, every single island you go to have a whole different culture, different backgrounds, and there's just no way to cover that all today. So it makes sense that I'll mostly be talking about Australia. Uh, you know, that'll come up a lot. And with Australia would include Tanzania. That's a little island at the south that's pretty much part of just Australia. Same uh, culture and everything. And then uh, also New Zealand, okay? And Australia and New Zealand, these are not third world countries like some we've talked about, right? These are, these are very advanced. In fact, in some way, in, in, in some uh, estimations, higher than even the United States when it comes to what they call... Uh, uh, quality of life, which Lord willing, I'll talk about that next week when we start talking about Europe. Okay. But what they call quality of life, you know, that's really the key, you know, what they're calling quality of life doesn't necessarily mean the best quality of life, especially from a Christian standpoint, but Australia, New Zealand, these rank higher than the United States, as far as what they claim to be a, a higher quality of life per person, how much money people make per, per individual, that's higher in Australia and New Zealand than the United States. Now, obviously, the United States dwarfs everybody as, as far as the, the overall wealth of the country. In fact, I was reading about this and, and, uh, and listening to somebody talk about this. It's a little confusing, but simplified, we could say this. Australia is actually, William, Australia is actually an LLC, get this, it's a little tricky, okay, and I'm not an expert on these things, but and it's an LLC of the United States. So, like in a manner of speaking, it's like United States owns uh, owns Australia, but not really the way it's all written out. Basically, what it is is says, hey, if, if our economy ever collapses, the United States has promised that they would bail them out. Surprise, surprise, we bail everybody out, <laughs> and so uh, and so that's actually kind of how it goes. But for the most part, Australia is doing just fine. They're doing really well. And, uh, and so New Zealand as well, 
But some of those little islands, now most of those islands are like Australia takes care of a lot of those islands, make sure that they're, they have what they need. Uh, uh, the United States actually makes, make, you know, covers a lot of those islands. Obviously, Hawaii, uh, we take care of that. And then uh, if you've ever heard of American Samoa, right, uh, we take care of them. And, and, uh, and so they survive under, you know, the, the authority of a larger country. But, uh, but mainly what we talk about when we say Oceania is Australia, New Zealand, and those. Um, let me see here. Now, when it comes to Christianity, just like most of the world, there's a lot of people, obviously, that claim to be Christians. But when you break it down, a lot of people have showed that there's a trend, particularly, now, a lot of the, there are a lot of islands that aren't very religious, Australia, New Zealand, and that, and, and, you know, that include Tasmania or, or I think the Australians call, call it Tassie, <laughs> right? And, uh, uh, there's, you know, the, the religion there, yes, there are a lot of so-called people who call themselves Christians, but what they've showed is there's a trend of people leaving the faith altogether. They're part of the, that nun group, you know, we're not, uh, not in you in like a Catholic nun, but none, like we don't belong to anything. We're just, we're non-Christians, right? They, and so that's growing in Australia, New Zealand. It's, it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, which makes sense. If you know, there are a lot of spokespeople from Australia that are kind of like celebrities in the United States. And there are a lot of those who are atheists and all that kind of stuff. So it kind of makes sense. But overall, there are a lot of people in Australia still call themselves Christians. There are some uh, influential Baptists there and, and all, but there's also a lot of big heretical religious groups based out of Australia. Number one would probably be, we would all know, Hillsong. That's like the big, that's where it started there in Australia. And in fact, if you look up like the top, like the biggest churches in Australia, it's Assemblies of God, Assemblies of God, Assemblies of God. They've got a huge uh, group there. And Hillsong, if you know, it's just pretty much just like, let's sing all these cool songs and let's just go and have like a little rock concert. If you actually knock on the door, if somebody goes to that church, they'll say, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. Yeah, I love Jesus and all this kind of stuff. I love singing and praising him and all this stuff. No idea what they believe, okay? Because it's not really taught in a lot of those churches, you know, non-denominational type church. Non-denominated, it's, it's assemblies of God, but they, but you know, a lot of those churches call themselves non-denominational. All right, so, so there's a huge influence there, but you know, it's just kind of a feel good, you know, or some of them just say, you know, our parents and our grandparents went to church, so we'll still go to church, but we don't really believe it. Just like a lot of the world that I've been talking about, that's kind of where they are. And we're seeing more and more, more and more of that in the United States. You know, we'll knock on doors, you know, hey, I've never really gone to church or I haven't gone to church in a really long time. And, and so, oh, well, do you believe the Bible? You believe in Jesus? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm a Christian. But, you know, practicing, no, they could probably care less. They don't know any of the verses in the Bible. They don't know any of the stories that you're talking about. Right. But they just claim to have faith. But it's, it's still an advantage because you can talk to them and say, well, let me show you what the Bible says. You said that you believe it. Let me show you what it says. Then they're faced with whether, whether they believe it or not. Okay? And what it comes down to, most people in this country, in this world, will say, yeah, there's some good stuff in there, but I don't believe all of the Bible. <laughs> right? that's, just, that's just how people are. But it's God's word. You've got to put all your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And the only, thing we, only way we know about the person of Jesus Christ is through the Bible. So you've got to trust that this is God's word because that's what tells you uh, what you're supposed to believe. Okay? So, so anyway, when it comes to Christianity in the islands, that's slightly different. Now, some of the you know, per capita, you know, the population, some of the numbers of the highest percentage of Christians are in some of these islands. East Timor, don't know anything about it. Anybody even heard that name? I'm just, I'm very, I bet you, yeah, I bet you do. Uh, uh, I, I've, I've so ashamed, like I've gone back after I've, I've preached some of these messages and I've told you, like I almost, almost too much. You know, I've told you like, hey, I don't know anything about geography. I don't know anything about this. I'm learning. This is good for me. And I'm trying to share with you, but I don't know a whole lot about that. And so sure enough, I've preached things. And then like after that, I find something out and I'm like, oh, I'm so embarrassed that I said that, you know, but just bear with me. okay? <laughs> there's going to be some, there's going to be some preaching here in a minute. All right. But East Timor is 90, is supposedly, now that depends on what numbers you read. And I've not been there. 
Uh, and we all know, like I said, you call yourself a Christian doesn't really mean anything. There's some countries that are like, you know, way high percentage of people that call themselves Christians, but they're all Catholic. You know, well, we understand what that's like. You know, there's some pros and cons. They do believe in the Bible. They do believe in some major doctrines uh, like the Trinity and stuff like that. It's a starting point, but they don't have the right faith in Jesus Christ. They don't have the faith in, uh, in uh, uh, grace alone. And, and so, uh, so that's the case. That's the matter. That's, that's just the, the, the way that it is in the world. So East Timor claims to be 98% Christian, which is mostly Catholic in, that, in this particular case. Number two... On the list, I'm just looking up all in all the world the places with the highest percentage of, of Christians, and uh, per cap, per capita, American Samoa is uh, claims to be I think 97. It's just a little bit under uh, East Timor, and American Samoa is uh, mostly they claim to be cap, uh, uh, they may claim to be Christian. It's mostly congregational Christian church in American Samoa, so some kind of a kind of unique. Christianity to them. And then second to that would be the Catholic Church. Third would be the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints. And then the and then next would be Methodist. Papua New Guinea is surprisingly a very large percentage of Christianity. It's like 95% or something like that claim to be Christians. Now that's surprising to me because Papua New Guinea like I said, has like some 800 languages or something like that and so many different people groups. In fact, I was just reading this documentary. Uh, you've all heard this about Papua New Guinea, the few things that we know about Papua New Guinea because you really don't hear a lot about that part of the world. But the few things that you do hear are about the shrunken heads and the cannibals and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, there are still tribes today that practice this. If, if a member of the family, if, if somebody just declares that there's a member of the family that has an, a, 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 de a demon or they're, they're like become a witch or something like that, they'll all turn on them. And they won't only kill them, but they'll eat them. It's just, it's, it's still today. And what's strange to me, what I don't understand is people go in there to observe and they're just like, oh, what an interesting culture. Let's just leave them alone. And then they leave and these guys are like, you know, so I was watching this documentary and they used, and they, they, they found this like 10 year old kid. No, no, no. I think it's like six year old kid. And the whole family had decided that, I don't know how they come to the conclusion, but they just decided like this kid is, uh, is, is, is wicked and so we've got to kill him. Somehow he was spared, like an uncle or something like that took him to another island, raised him. And it's kind of a neat story because now I don't know what kind of denomination, but he claims, you know, they started going to a Christian church and all this stuff. And then, and actually as he got older and had some money uh, and could have done whatever he wanted, he chose to go back. I don't know permanently or not, but he went to go went back to the island to his family and he was going to teach them that what they were doing is wrong and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> and uh, so, wow, just, just crazy that there's actually on this country, on this island, people who still practice this kind of pagan, you know, kind of weird stuff. And yet the island as a whole claims to be 95% Christian, you know? And uh, so here's the interesting thing. Number one, uh, as far as the ranking, I don't know who came up with this. So I'm just taking their word for it. Number one denomination in Papua New Guinea of Christians is, is Lutheran. Second would be Seventh-day Adventist, right? So you got 95% claiming to be, they're, they're claiming that 95% of the population are Christians, but you've got these people that aren't teaching the right gospel. You know, they're ba baptizing babies and they're, you know, preaching uh, heresy and all this stuff. That makes sense. Okay, but... I'll come back to this in a little bit, but here's what I want you to think about. And here's what I want you to be burdened about is the fact that every country that I've studied, South America, the remote parts of Africa and all that, you talk, you start reading into the missionaries that are there and the evangelistic work that's going on there. And you're finding Seventh-day Adventists. You're finding Mormons. You're finding Jehovah's Witnesses. And you're like, where are they all coming from? Right, they're out there. They're doing the work. They're going into the into the uh, to the the huts, you know. They're going into the villages and they're and they're seeking out and they're converting these people. And obviously, they're not getting saved. That they're preaching them a false gospel. But look, it's not really that much different in the United States. You know, we, we're going into these neighborhoods and like, hey, you're the only one that's ever knocked on my door, other than the Jehovah's Witnesses, right? So it's like, you know, there's other people out there doing it, but they're just. Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons or somebody. And most of those people think they're going to heaven by doing that. 
I remember talking to this guy for a while and, and uh, he was, but he kept answering like, hey, well, you just got to do good works. You got to, you know, give to people. You got to do all these things. I'm like, no, 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 that's not part of your salvation. And I was telling him, uh, you know, hey, you know, you could go out and you could do all these things, but that's not going to get you to heaven. He's like, well, why are you doing what you're doing right now? I said, what do you mean? Like, why am I knocking on the door? Yeah, don't you think that's going to get you to heaven? I'm like, no, <laughs> knocking on the door, number one, because I don't want you to go to hell, right? Number two, I'm laying up rewards for myself in heaven, but that's not my eternal life. My eternal life is based on what Jesus did, and I began to teach him that. Look, most people aren't teaching that. If you, knock on, if, if you knock on a Jehovah's Witness door, you knock on a Mormon's door, and you ask them what the good news is that they're preaching, what is it that they're using their time to do, they're not showing people how to get to heaven. They're just like, well, we got to show them how to, you know, follow this book. We got to show them how to, you know, uh, have Bible studies or, or something. They're just lost. It's the blind leading the blind. Okay, but there's a real lack of true Bible believers that are going out and doing the work. And that's a really sad part of the state of Christianity in the world. All right, what about in the United States? Because a lot of these uh, messages I've kind of been bringing back to, like, let's look at, especially here, the, what's the influence of these other countries on the United States? And I've been looking at the population, for instance, Latin America. Well, let's look how many Latin Americans are in the United States and what their contributions have been to our society and to our culture and all that. Well, not really as obvious with Oceania. Okay, and uh, I struggle with that a little bit. The population of the islanders or even those from Australia and New Zealand, you know, really, really small in the United States. Reason why? People in Australia are, for the most part, pretty happy where they are. They have no reason to want to come to the United States. You know, now there are some, like some celebrities and stuff like that that are from Australia, from New Zealand, uh, you know, making, making millions, uh, you know, fr from us. And surprisingly, there are a lot of Australians that are obsessed with politics in the United States. This is a weird phenomenon, okay? Because I'm an American, and I'm, the, I'm a citizen of the United States, and I think that our, our politics is weird and messed up and skewed and all this kind of stuff. But you know what? The whole rest of the world thinks the exact same thing, and it's like watching a train wreck. They just can't look the other way, and they're, and they're so obsessed with our politics. I remember this guy, uh, uh, you know, a friend of mine, his, I met his dad, and, and, uh, and he's, from, he's from Canada. And it's a long story. They're always proud to be Can Canadians, and they're talking about their health care so much better than our health care, and this and that, and, and all this kind of stuff. And at the end of the day, like, I, I, I was watching their dad's uh, Facebook post. And everything he was posting was about politics and about the election and the, in the United States. And I'm like, you're from Canada. Why are you so concerned about our politics? But they are, the whole world. One of the reasons is because we're such a superpower that they, they want to know what's going on because it's going to affect them, right? And then, too, it's just like I said, it's like watching a train wreck. They just can't get enough of, of watching it. But Australia actually has, by the way, the United States has censored so much of conservative, uh, like true conservative points of view that actually a lot of people are watching, you know, these radio shows from Australia, you know, where, because there's still a lot of, you know, conservatives in Australia and they have similar government like uh, Republicans and Democrats, that kind of an idea in Australia. And there's a lot of, of radio shows and talk shows and, and, uh, and vlogs and stuff like that, that people in the United States are starting to turn to to watch about politics in our own country. <laughs> it's, really, it's really a strange phenomenon, but this is what uh, we see. Now, when you're breaking down the demographics of, of uh, Oceania, you know, the population, uh, Oceanian Americans, I guess, the number one place where you see them is in Hawaii. Well, that makes sense because all Hawaiians you know, are part of the islands. And so since that is part of the United States, that's where the biggest population of the islanders are. Okay, and uh, But then second would be in the United States, in California. So if you go to California, you might find some uh, islanders and some uh, Oceania, however you say the Oceanians. Okay, but apart from that, the percentage of native Oceania immigrants to the United States is super, super small. They're quite happy where they are. You know, they have little need to flee to the United States. 
uh, you know, the islands, they can, they can get their help from Australia or they can immigrate to Australia or whatever, and they've got everything that they need. And the cost of living, from what I understand, is fine, and the, and the pay is fine. I think Australia has one of the highest uh, uh, minimum wages in the world. You know, I think Biden's probably going to try to beat that, but, but they, they got a high minimum wage, you know, whatever that does to the economy. Uh, but that's that's just how it is. And so all these numbers look good on paper and all the people there are fine. Their health care, they're, they're happy with the way that things are. OK, so the United States is obviously a big ally of theirs. Uh, they would, you know, there's some of their trade and stuff like that is dependent on the United States but not all of it. They're close to China and all these other, they can get, you know, they can trade with all these other places. Uh, but there is a little bit of a, um, of a, uh, uh, partnership there. Okay. Now the biggest influence, if you were to say what influence, particularly Australia, what influence has Australia had on the United States? I was thinking and thinking and thinking and trying to figure out what is, is it music? Do you know what music is Australian? All I can think about is the didgeridoo. Anybody know what that is? It's like this big instrument. It's like that hasn't really influenced our music that much. Okay, what what uh what has have we had like you know you know the I the anybody know what Australian cuisine is like? No, I just looked over there and saw Nutella. Now I I like Nutella. I didn't used to, but it, it's grown on me. I like Nutella. But what's the other stuff that Vegemite? Everyone's like, oh, Vegemite is Australian. Everybody I know, including Australians, says it's nasty, but they eat it anyway. Right? I can't think of anything Australian that is like an American cuisine. Now, maybe we're going to eat something tonight that is from Australia or New Zealand. Looks to me like everything over there is like from Fiji or some of the islands or something like that. So that would bring the next question. Well, what about them as the islands? Well, I don't know of any influence from Papua New Guinea on the United States. I mean, I don't think we're shrinking heads or accepting cannibalism or <laughs> like that. tattoos. That's a good one. That's a good one. I didn't think about that. The influence and you probably elsewhere as well, but that's true. If you look at the pictures, we don't have pictures. We don't have pictures here, but in, in Iola, we got pictures and there's a lot of those tribes that are just all tatted up and pierced up. And they got the, the bamboos through their nostrils, you know, yeah, I think I saw that the other day. It was metal, <laughs> but it was, <laughs> and uh, and the tattoos and everything just all over, uh, all over people. Yeah, face tattoos. Like, you know, it used to be common. I mean, mil people in the military get tattoos here and stuff like that. But you never would have thought that they would just put them all over their face. Like, if you saw a movie back in like the '80s, '90s, and people had tattoos on their face, they were like some strange, like cult, you know, whatever. And nowadays, man, it's just a common thing to get tattoos all over their face. I don't know how common it is, but it is a, it is a, it is a thing. So that's true. That's one uh, thing that has influenced us a little bit. Now, how about this? I could say maybe. I don't think we needed this influence, but I could say maybe Hawaii and some of the islands like that has influenced a little bit of our like nakedness as a culture. Does that make sense? Because if you remember, if you back like movies and stuff like that in the in the 50s, you know, um, thinking Elvis and stuff like that, there are a lot of movies where they're on the beach and, you know, they're on the beach at Waikiki and they're hula dancers and all that kind of stuff. And that really started infiltrating our culture with the beach and they're just not wearing very much clothes. So maybe that's an influence, uh, you know, that 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 you could say kind of affected us. But for the most part, I think I'm going to do better with this message to talk about our influence on them. But the way that I want to do that is, is uh, that make it more spiritualized, I guess, is what our, why our influence on them has done very little for evangelism. Okay. And I'll make some application that I think we can take beyond just our, just our missionaries over there. But I'm, but I'm going to bring some of that into it as well. All right. Number one. Here's a problem that we have is share the sharing of our culture in the wrong ways. And I've mentioned this with other parts of the world where they watch us, they watch our movies, they watch our, you know, they read our books, they do. And, and, and most of what they're getting from our culture is not a positive influence. It's not a righteous influence or a biblical influence by any means. Uh, they're just seeing basically a lot of times just how wicked we are. In fact, I was reading about this, uh, I was, I don't remember how I got to this exactly, but on Wikipedia, there was this place, this, this page that showed all the banned movies in Australia. 
okay? And so a lot of these are probably movies that you could get in the United States, right? But Australia said, oh, those are too wicked. We won't, we're not going to watch that because of the violence or the, you know, some. Now, nah, probably they've, rele they've released some of that now. But back in the day, you know, it was like, no, that is too wicked. That's talking about things that we don't want our people to see or whatever. And they were actually banning a lot of these movies. A lot of parts of the world do that, by the way. I mean, we already talked about North Korea. I mean, you know, you're going to go to jail, maybe even get killed if you listen to K-pop. <laughs> so, uh, a lot, and that's, that's Korean. I guess that's not American, but you know what I mean? That is actually the Western influence on them, though, that is what North Korea is actually noticing. The skinny jeans, the mullets. Who came up with the mullet? That's American made, man. <laughs> but North Korea said, nah, -uh, not in our culture. And so they had to ban the mullet and the skinny jeans. <laughs> All right. So uh, uh, anyway, we're sharing of our culture in the wrong ways. Now, here's an inter interesting thing, because I've mentioned this and I do believe this is true. You know, what could we do towards evangelizing the world? You know, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. Well, we understand that we're, you know, we can get behind missions. In Iola, you've seen the plaques. We've got a lot of missionaries that we support, you know, really small amounts to these different missionaries just so we can say we have a part in all these, uh, in these ministries. We really don't know what's going on. We don't know what they're doing, right? But we can just say, hey, we're doing our part by giving some money to, to these missionaries, right? And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute. But, uh, but not only that, I've talked about how Nowadays, everybody, even in the most remote parts and the poorest countries in the world, have access to the Internet. And so there's a lot of Bible preaching that they can get on the Internet. Uh, there's all kinds of information. But, you know, I got to thinking about this with Australia. Now, Australia probably watches more American TV than we do. They probably watch. More. OK, here's another thing. Also, from what I understand, Australia has a ban uh, if I, I know this because I kept watching and I'd see on these YouTube videos, they would be advertising this, uh, uh, is it called like VPN or something like that? Does that make sense? Does that sound VPN? They were advertising this like VPN or something like that. And what it is, if you're traveling and you go to Australia and you want to watch your Netflix or your whatever kind of movies from the United States, there are certain shows that aren't allowed over there. Like they're blocked. You know, now I think the main reason they would do that is because they want you to watch their shows that they're promoting, that their economy is, 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 you know, instead of everybody just watching the United States, you know, I think that's why they do that. And so this thing, I kept seeing this advertisement about, you know, some computer program or I don't know how you describe it, but it allows you to be, it kind of unlocks it so that you can watch that. So everybody in Australia just has that <laughs> device. So they're still watching all the American uh, uh, shows and YouTube videos and stuff like that. So where, why was I saying that? Okay, because here's the thing we could say, oh, great. They've got all of our, you know, uh, social media and they've got all of our videos and all of our, you know, our preaching and all that. YouTube, how many good preaching videos are on YouTube? Yeah, but you know what they also have? All the garbage, right? They're not just watching, just not flipping through. Let me find some good preaching. No, there's also the things that are making fun of those preachers. There's also the militant atheists that are like going down. Some of those guys like live. Here's the weirdest thing in the world. Weirdest thing in the world. You claim to be an atheist. You claim not to believe in God, yet you devote your entire life to correcting people online and proving to them that there is no God. It sounds to me like it's more than just you don't believe there's a God, because if you didn't believe there's a God, you'd say, I don't care what the Christians do. I'm going to go live my life. It's short. I don't have that much life to live, right? But they don't do that. They spend their entire time, I've got to go evangelize the world to my non-religious views, right? Which is actually a religion. And, uh, and it's the weirdest thing, but guess what? Australia, New Zealand, they're getting all that. You know, they're getting all the bad education and all the bad things from the United States as well. So over the years, that's really not helping the, United, the, the uh, Australia, which is why it's increasingly, which the United States is too, by the way, but it's increasingly going atheist. It's increasingly going, you know, non, uh, uh, non-religious, you know, it's going to be like some of the Euro other European, not other, but some of the European countries, <clears throat> which we'll talk about next week. So sharing our culture in the wrong ways is, uh, is part of the problem. See, they not only see 
have the opportunity to see the good things, but they see all the smut, they see all the bad uh, uh, videos and listen to the bad music and, and all that kind of stuff as well. What we need as far as evangelism goes is laborers, foot soldiers on the field, giving the gospel, knocking the doors, preaching the gospel, going into the markets and the, uh, you know, the malls and, and any place where there's crowds of people and giving the gospel. And I say that because in a lot of places, missionaries will tell us that in a lot of countries, they have walls, they have things blocked off. You can't knock on the doors like we do in the United States. I've heard that so many times. They'll say, yeah, but you can put tracks in the mailbox. And so they've quit knocking doors and they're just putting tracks in the mailbox because they said, no, you don't understand. We can't knock doors. Well, you can go someplace where the people hang out and you can start talking to them and you can preach the gospel to them face to face because that's the way that it's going to work. All right. Now, I'm not saying I, I'm not even trying to make the argument that somebody can't read something and get saved. But here's what I'm going to say. I would say it's 100 times more effective if you look somebody in the face and they can see, you know, it's a, I don't know how the spirit even works through that. You know, it's kind of like, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but if you watch a preaching online, it might be great preaching. You might learn a lot from it, but it doesn't have the same spiritual value as if you actually go to church and you sit in the congregation where there's preaching. It's, it's a more spiritual, you know, activity whenever you're there. And so, you know, uh, so, you know, they need foot soldiers on the ground. Now, obviously, I'm not saying, hey, everybody needs to sign up, you know, for the next flight out to Australia and become missionaries in Australia because the entire world needs to hear the gospel. You know, so all we can do is go where we are going, you know, and do what our mission is right now, which this church, obviously, we have a mission to, to knock on every door in Kansas City and preach them the gospel. That's a pretty good mission. We'll just start there. Right. But as the opportunity opens and as we see opportunity to go on different trips to different parts of the world or or send a missionary to the, a different part of the world or something, uh, that's the only thing that is going to work. And you know what? There's missionaries in all these countries praying. We need laborers. Send us laborers. You know, we've got a guy coming on the 25th. Uh, I guess I'd be next week, next Wednesday to Iola, and he's our missionary to Portugal, right? Brother uh, Mart, uh, uh, Lionel Martin. And, he, and same thing. I mean, as soon as he talked to me, he's like, he's like, you know, man, we just need laborers, you know. And, and, without, and, and not so many words, he basically said, hey, you know anybody that wants to be a missionary? We need laborers. We need. Every missionary says that. And they've got a burden for their country and they see the need and they see that look all over the whole world. And that's what we need. OK, but obviously we can't all do it. Uh, one, you know, we can't all do it ourselves. We just need to keep on making more disciples and keep on, you know, taking the trips and, 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 and uh, you know, missionary trips and all that kind of stuff. All right. Secondly, here's what I think is a big problem. One thing about Oceania is it's probably one of the bigger places that we travel for vacation. You know, we go to Hawaii, we go to some of these places uh, for, uh, for uh, as tourists, you know, we go there just to enjoy our holidays or whatever. We go to see the different sites. <clears throat> and, uh, and, you know, I... Uh, I've, again, I've been a Christian for a long time, been going to churches a long time, seen a lot of missionaries in my life, seen a lot of missionaries come by to present their, their ministry. And they've got video presentations. Look, I've, I've in my heart surrendered to about 50 different mission fields because you watch those videos and you're just like, man, they need help. I want to go there, you know, or you're like, Hey, that looks like a cool place, man. I'd really like to go there. And, uh, and let me just go ahead and talk about that for a second. Okay. So, so here's the big danger. Okay. So we talk about tourism instead of evangelism, okay? Tourism, we think in the, uh, in the sense of, oh man, it would be so cool to go to Australia. Why? So you can see the kangaroos. So you can see the koalas. What's the newest thing, that, the little quokkas? Who knows what a quokka is? In the southwest island of Australia, it's the only place where they have them, there's little things, they look kind of like uh, uh, chipmunks, but they're like a cross between a chipmunk and a rat. They got these really long tails, and they got these cute little chipmunk faces. And somebody went over there. They call them the cutest, uh, the happiest, the, it was the happiest uh, animals in the world, or something like that. And they, because they look happy, they're smiling. Now there's some stories that say that when a predator's coming. Oh, by the way, they got a pouch like a kangaroo where they can put the baby in there. And there, there's a story that says some people deny it, but because they don't want to believe that their little cute little friends would do such a thing. But there's stories that whenever a predator comes. 
uh, they will take their baby and they'll throw it to the predator so they can buy them some time to get away, right? But anyway, they're called the most, the friendliest uh, uh, animal on earth because they look so happy and they look so cute, okay? So what happened was somebody went as a tourist, they went over there and they, uh, they saw this cute little uh, animal and the animals will come right up to you. In fact, all the rangers and everything are saying, hey, don't feed the quokkas. Don't go you know, and get too close to the quokkas. We don't want them to be so comfortable with people because they'll, they'll go up there. What everybody was doing is they're taking selfies. And these selfies were going online and on social media and they were blowing up. They were going viral because these animals are so cute. And so people will spend their money and go on a trip to that southwest island in Australia just so they can go see some quokkas that, aren't, that are just as common as squirrels around here, right? They're just everywhere. And the natives are kind of like, what? What? in the world, right? But everybody's like, oh, they're so cute. I want to get a selfie with it. And, uh, and so, so that's how it is. Australia has is, is, is got some very unique animals, you know. A while back, I did a, uh, uh, you know, long story, I'm not promoting it, but I, I, I did a little coloring book where I, was, I just drew these little different animals, and I drew the mother and the baby. It was during a time when, when Valerie was pregnant, and we were waiting for Viviana, and, and <clears throat> long story. But, uh, but I noticed that several of the animals that I drew back to back were all from Australia, all right? So I did a kangaroo, a koala, a platypus. Platypus is, is very unique to Australia. Uh, do you know there's even an island in Australia or off the coast of Australia where there's penguins? It's like, you know, I don't, it's like average climate, like 70s, you know, maybe 50s at the lowest, and it's got penguins. So apparently penguins don't have to live in a cold climate. Uh, I heard some funny jokes about that. Never mind, I won't even share them, but they're, they're <laughs> see me afterwards. <laughs> so... Uh, uh, but anyway, the animals are, are just amazing. Now, I know we're talking about Oceania, but the same is true for Africa. People go, oh, I want to go to Kenya one day. Well, why do you want to go to Kenya? Because I want to go visit the Serengeti. I want to go on a, on a, a safari trip, ride in one of those uh, off-road vehicles, and I want to see the elephants, and I want to see the giraffes, and I want to see all these kinds of things. Look, God gave us some amazing animals. He gave us a lot of great things to look at. I'm not against vacations. I love going to different places and seeing different things, but here's where it becomes a problem. When our efforts in reaching the lost turn into tourism instead of evangelism. And I'm going to tell you this, it is a problem with missionaries. Okay. One of the problems is, you know, how do we bring people here? How do we attract people from the United States to come and help us? We get them to come on trips and we say, hey, don't you want to come see the cute little animals, right? And so then the whole ministry becomes sending, I'm not saying a whole ministry, I'm, that's quite a generalization, but, uh, but, you know, taking these pictures of these cute animals and look at the cuisine that we eat and look at the mountains and the topography and look how beautiful this land is and, and don't you want to come to this beautiful land? And there was a trend for a while where missionaries were taking note of this and they were saying, well, wait a minute. Our missionary slides are all landscape and animals and all this stuff. We don't even have people in our in our missionary slides. And so they were make so whenever somebody was creating a missionary slide, they would say, We don't want to do that. People are, I mean, I don't want to, I don't say this the wrong way, but people are starting to catch on to that. And they're saying, Hey, this is we we want to see the people, right? So then they just started showing all the faces of the starving kids and the cute kids with snot coming down their face and the cute, you know, the, all these things because they wanted to grip your heartstrings with this. And hey, man, any, any video slide that I saw of Africa that had the people singing in the background would lead me to tears. And I'd be like, I'm ready to go now, Lord, because I thought I was going to go to Africa. And when I heard the people singing, it doesn't even matter. They might have been singing something totally heathen, right? But I heard their voices and I was like, oh, that just tugs at my, my heartstrings and I just want to go, right? But the thing is, you're not going there as a tourist. You're going over there with that mindset that I want to reach these people for the Lord. And that's what's going to get the job done. Now, how, does that, how could that even apply to us? Well, don't you think that we could be guilty of doing the same thing, right? Now, Again, I want to make this clear, you know, you can't just work, 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 work and drive people into the ground. It's not going to get as much done as if they actually enjoy themselves in the process, okay? So I don't think it's wrong to 
for example, go, go look at Big Brutus before we have a soul winning event, right? We took a trip and we reached that small town. We knocked on doors, saw a lot of people saved. But the day before we said, hey, let's go take a trip, look at Big Brutus. Uh, if you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. But, uh, but we went and took a trip. Afterwards, hey, hang around, we'll buy you Mexican food. Nothing wrong with that. That's quite motivating, okay? But you know that you could get to the point where it's all about those side things. It's all about the food. It's all about, you know, going there for the enjoyment. And what are we going to see? And, oh, I want to go to that country because, of, you know, I've always wanted to see the beaches. I've always wanted to see the ocean and all that stuff. And wait a minute, that's not why you're going. And so we could do the same thing here. Like, I, you know, when do we get together so we can be with our friends? And when do we go, you know, to... And so here's the mindset that a lot of people have. And I've seen this my whole life. You were in First Kings chapter 10, and I'm not going to go back and read all these things, but he talks about the uh, queen of Sheba and she comes and well, look at the beginning, look at the first uh, verse here. It says, and when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to prove him with hard questions. And it's funny as you read that, she's like, and she saw the wisdom of Solomon. Right. And right there's like, I went to go see his wisdom in the Lord and all this kind of stuff. And then she's like, and I saw his wisdom. And what did she actually see? She saw all the gold and she saw all the, you know, the fancy like a uh, building and all these elaborate things. And then it even talks about the apes and the peacocks, right? All these animals. And, and he had really built himself and he had imported, uh, uh, you know, horses and, uh, and just really just what she was really seeing is just all of the, the stuff that he had accumulated. Now, sometimes we look at stuff and we say, well, it's a blessing from God. And then the danger is, and we can do this in our churches and we do it all the time, is the danger is I want everybody to see how much God's blessing us. And so therefore I want them to see this big building and I want to see lots of people in here and, and they all look just the part with their suits and their ties and they know how to say the right words and their hair's cut the right way. And I want them to come so they can see the wisdom of the Lord and see the blessings of the Lord. But really what they're seeing is the stuff. Right. And if we're not careful, that's what we're that's what we're actually trying to sell. That's what we're trying to promote. And I'll tell you, that's what most churches, that's how they do their evangelism nowadays. Well, we got to have a big building. We got to have really cool programs. We got to have lots of cool people in here so that the people on the outside say, hey, I want to see what's going on. I want to go see the wisdom of uh, of uh, Iola Baptist Temple concerning the Lord, you know. But if we're not careful, what we're actually doing is showing off all of our stuff and look what we've accomplished and look how much God's blessed us. And I want you to see where that leads. Look at 1 Kings 11, the next chapter. But King Solomon loved many strange women. And you know how that went. He ended up making God really upset because he went after these strange women and he added them to his, I mean, a thousand wives or a thousand women, I should say, uh, you know, uh, what is it, 300 uh, wives and 700 concubines, a thousand women, right, from all different ethnicities, and uh, and he was trying to entertain them, and he was trying to, you know, and so he ends up actually building altars to their gods. God gets very, very upset with them. Well, what leads to that? Well, anytime you got people who are just living extravagantly, and they got all their needs taken care of, and they don't really need any help from anybody else, all they want to do is just show off their wisdom and show off their wealth, and hey, look how God's blessed us. The next thing you're going to see, they feel like they don't need the Lord anymore, and they start going the wrong directions. And so... Uh, you come to a church like Hillsong. I'm not just trying to pick on just one church because it happens all over the world in every different denomination, including Baptist, for the, for, uh, uh, by the way. You, but you got Hillsong. This place is just, man, the whole world just loves Hillsong. And they're all buying this CD. And look at how big the building is and all that stuff. And then you got the pastors living in adultery with other women, uh, you know, behind closed doors. You got uh, the, the fa his father, from what I understand, now, that, this was the guy in New York, Hillsong. In Australia, I remember hearing that there was a cover-up. His father actually was like a pedophile, and they kind of put it under the rug and all this kind of stuff. I'm telling you, wicked things go on in a lot of these places because it's not really about the wisdom of God. It's not really about preaching the gospel. Maybe it started that way in some cases, but what it becomes is, hey, look how wonderful we are. And I'm going to tell you what happens in a lot of Baptist churches because I've been, I've been down this road I had a father who was in the ministry. I've been an assistant pastor, and my my 
my pastor was also my father-in-law, which gave me some of the inside, you know, uh, uh, inside view of it. And I've hosted a lot of missions. I've had a lot of guest speakers come to me. And I've gone to other churches where they've had me preach and all this. And I'm going to tell you what becomes a, a, a really dangerous thing for pastors. It's this mentality of, you know what, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Hey, you come here, let me pour out the, you know, wine and dine you, take you to the nice places and give you all this extreme, put you in a nice hotel. Look, we try, I try to do that to people too. I want to take care of them because they're our guests. Uh, but sometimes you're just pouring out the, the extravagance. And what you're hoping that they'll do is that they'll have, they'll call you to come preach for them now. And it's like, hey, you remember how I took care of you? Now you're going to take care of me. And I'm telling you, it's a trap that people fall into where it's like, man, I just got to have all the nice stuff so that the Queen of Sheba will come and look at the great wisdom, you know, that God's blessed us with. And where it's going to lead is 1 Kings chapter 11, where they're going to fall in sin because they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing, which is actually showing the, you know, the, the people that whose lives have been changed and the people who've learned the gospel and they've learned the, uh, uh, the doctrines of God and they've learned the Bible, you know, this is what's important. You know, if we're going to show anything off, not that we should show off, but you know what I mean? If we're going to show off, Hey, go see my zeal for the Lord. You know what I mean? If we want to show something off, you know, see my good works that they may glorify God. Right. And so, and so they want to see what you're doing. See the people that you're leading to the Lord. See the, 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 those types of efforts, not to show off, but just to, because that's what you're supposed to be doing, right? And so, uh, so very important. You start going, getting into thinking of church as like an industry and big money and, and, and trying to, you know, get in, rub elbows with people. And what you're going to find is that they do very little work for the Lord. You know, when it really comes down to it, and those churches eventually just become social clubs and and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> I'm gonna tell you, I, I'm gonna tell you, I'm a, a little hobby horse. Excuse me for a minute, but I'm gonna tell you one thing that as I've always despised. And just the other day, my wife was showing me because uh, it's a pet peeve of mine. So she showed me somebody had posted, and this is a church, this pretty big church in Kansas, small town Kansas, and uh, and pretty well known, you know, among the preachers in Kansas, pretty big, fairly big church. And he said, hey, we can't, I can't wait for this next week. This next week, we're going to start a new series that's based on this book. And what they did is they read some book that some man wrote about, hey, here's what you need to do, you know, uh, to be blessed by God or here, who knows what the book's about. But then based on this book, they're going to preach a series of messages. I mean, does anybody see what's wrong with that? You don't, here's the book that you're supposed to preach from, right? You don't preach from some book that somebody's preached where they mention this book and just say, oh, doesn't he have some great insight? This is where Christianity has gone wrong, hey, because they want to see like this great knowledge of this man or whatever. No, we need to get people to the real wisdom of God, which comes from the Bible. And we need to show them that. Okay, so the last thing is simply, I've kind of already uh, uh, touched on it a little bit, and that's this, the lack of hard work. I'm sure, let me say it this way. The lack of hardworking, soul-winning Baptists, okay? Because there's people out there doing the work. Who's, do, who's converting these people in Papua New Guinea? Who's converting these people on the islands? You know, Seventh-day Adventists, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses. You know, some of them are trying to work their way to heaven. And so they're going out there and they're doing the work. It's kind of surprising how many people think that their works are going to get them to heaven that do nothing for the Lord, Right? But here are uh, these people that believe that, that that's going to get them to heaven or something like that, they, or, or some higher level of, uh, of the celestial, you know, the, you know what I'm talking about? I was talking to this Mormon, and they said, uh, I said, well, so you guys don't actually believe like you go to heaven. He said, well, there, we believe that there's three different, I can't remember what they call them. There's like the terrestrial and the celestial, and, and there's like three levels of heaven. And they heard him describe, this was, she was a Latter-day Saint. I think I said Job's witness. She's a, a Mormon or a Latter-day Saint. And she said, well, she's like 90 years old. And, she, and she'd been in, or maybe not, this was a different lady. She wasn't 90, but probably like 70. And she had been in, the, in this church from almost all of her life. <clears throat> and she believed that, somebody might have been pretty good in this life and only made it to the first level, you know, but we can be baptized for that person. And then that person, because we got baptized for them, they might move up to the second level of heaven. 
which is like just kind of like an elevated, uh, uh, what's the Catholic purgatory, right? It's just like purgatory. Hey, we'll do things and we'll pray for our loved ones and, and maybe our loved ones will get farther up heaven. Look, none of that's in the Bible. And so you got these people like just spreading out this false doctrine from some fake books and some fake theology, uh, theologians, and, uh, and they're not really preaching the Bible. And then you got people that have the truth. They've got the, true, the knowledge of Jesus Christ. They've got, they've got the true gospel. They know, they understand the Bible, they see where it all is, and they're playing church. And they're rubbing elbows with these other people. And they're building an empire and all this stuff and saying, hey, come see my peacocks and my apes. <laughs> right? And you're just like, ah, it's easy to fall in that trap. I'm not just trying to criticize everybody. We can all, we could all be guilty of it. But what we must do when it comes to evangelizing and preaching the gospel is realize that it's not those things that is supposed to be, whether, it, whether that's what impresses people or not, what people really need to see is Christ. Look at Mark chapter four, almost done. Mark chapter 4, verse 18. So you're probably familiar with this. Uh, the seed was, was uh, sown, all right, and it goes to different types of soil, and the soils picture the hearts of men. All right, so that's a great principle. As we go out and we preach the gospel, you know, it doesn't matter. We, if we preach the gospel, somebody claimed to get saved and we don't ever see fruit, it's not our fault. Right? We just, our job is to preach the gospel. We don't know what their heart's like and how they receive it and all that stuff. So don't fall into that trap saying that we need to see their works before we pronounce them saved or something like that. The only person that's not saved in this, uh, in this illustration here is the one where the sun comes up and the, and the seed never goes takes, takes root. You see what I'm saying? But everyone else, they're receiving the seed. They're receiving the truth. And so the, it represents people that actually get saved, but then they're not fruitful. They're not producing anything. But here's one of the things, and, and this is slightly out of the usual context that you'll read this in, but here's what it says in verse 18. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as, uh, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things entering in choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. All right. Now, we've heard that applied different ways, I'm sure. But the main point that I want to show you is that this, that it's easy for a Christian to believe the gospel you know, a lot of people went off to Bible college or they went to say, hey, I'm going to be on the mission field or I'm going to do something great for the Lord. It started with the right intention, right? They, they wanted to do something for the Lord. But then as they started, the cares of this world and, you know, the desire and the lust for different things or whatever, it affected them to where just like those, those thorns choked out, choked out that seed, they were unfruitful. They weren't able to do anything for the Lord because they allowed the cares of this world. And a guy could make it all the way to the mission field and have the exact same thing happen to them where they're not effective for the Lord. He could become a pastor of a church and maybe even people under him and people that are getting saved and people that are, have been added to the church are still going out and doing the work, but the pastor has allowed the cares of this world to choke him out and he's not, he's not fruitful, okay? And this is a very dangerous situation. Bible says, we won't go there right now, but, uh, but you're familiar with this verse uh, in Luke 12. It says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. All right? Look, you're going to have food to eat. Amen? All you, if, all you ate, uh, if all you ate was Thursdays whenever you come here, <laughs> you'd probably be just fine for the week. Uh, I, I actually was feeling very convicted the other day. I was listening to this, pre I was listening to this message. I think it was uh, Brother Jimenez. He was preaching on gluttony. And I don't know why I did it, but I listened to it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. And he was preaching on gluttony, and I was convicted. And here's why I was convicted. Not because I can easily fall into being gluttonous, but because he said this. He said, he said those, he said, you got to be careful who you hang around. Because if you hang around other people that are gluttons and they have bad eating habits, it's going to rub off on you. And he, throws some, he threw some, some 
uh, facts out there, some percentage. And it said, you know, if you have a friend who's overweight because they're, they eat too much, you are so many, so much percent more likely to, lo- to, to gain weight. And I'm thinking, I remember when we started this work, we have some skinny people in here. And I think that we're rubbing off on you guys and we got to be careful. And so that's something that we're, gonna, we're working on. OK, but we don't ever want to get to this point where we're just all about the lust of the flesh and about, you know, uh, yeah, if, if that's why you're coming. Hey, you got houses at home to eat in. Right. That's not the uh, that's not why we come to church. But we do enjoy eating. We do enjoy the fellowship. We do enjoy those things. We just got to make sure that we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. OK, all these other things are going to be OK. We're going to have food. We're going to have clothing. We're going to have houses to sleep in and and all that kind of stuff. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for many missionaries throughout history uh, who have suf- uh, sacrificed greatly to preach the gospel. And I, and I mean, here in the United States, uh, evangelists uh, and, uh, and then those who go abroad as well. Help us all to do the work of an evangelist, Lord. Help us realize that the mission field is everywhere. It's not just in the remote parts of Africa or, uh, or Papua New Guinea, uh, but it's everywhere. And help us not forget uh, the, the doors that we're knocking right here in our own neighborhoods and and uh, the people that need to be saved everywhere we go. And Lord, if you would allow us to go overseas and make some, uh, some mission trips where we can preach the gospel in other, uh, in other countries, I would love that. I think that'd be great. But Lord, help us not just go there because we want a vacation and we want to get away, uh, but help everything that we do to be motivated first by seeking the kingdom of God and, and your righteousness and uh, and seeing souls saved, Lord, I pray that you'll bless those efforts, be glorified by it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.